two. Okay, for those now I see uh, it. Yeah, for those record. watching, I hit the record button and then it asked if I was sure I wanted to record. So you don't you you didn't see the past five minutes of what we talked about because oh, I'm an idiot. Great. Dude, that was a riveting conversation. That was that was a riveting so conversation. Much. I missed so much. So the um, last time that I saw Rich was when he came to my shop when he was visiting New York, and there was about 14 people in a space the size of a shoebox, and he right. did not physically fit in the space. Oh, so back away from yeah, I was like, no, this is this is too much. I can't. You know, it's it's the the thing that you see on YouTube versus what you see in person can be two different things sometimes. Like the expectation was that I was like, wow, he's running this crazy business that has a thousand employees. It's a four thousand square foot shop in like downtown New York, and that wasn't the case. It's like a little postage stamp. Yeah, the, the real estate here is ridiculously overpriced, as you may have seen from a couple. Oh of years. yes. I've heard you have lots of things to say about the New York real estate. Um, but honestly, the, uh, the I guess the main point that I wanted to bring up today, number one, I wanted to know what the purpose of you being in Boston is next week. So you're going to be visiting us in Boston, a bunch of different shops. Why are you coming to Boston? Excuse me. Uh, so um, I wanted to try and get more than just one or two people to show up when there is a lobbying day or a testifying day for the right to repair bill in that state. So I was going to visit every single repair shop personally and a uh, try to convince them that it is actually worth their time to whether it's Zoom or show up at the Boston State House in, per in person, actually talk to someone about this. Uh, B, figure out what their concerns for the industry are and how I can potentially address them with either of these two nonprofits I have. And C, Get the uh, try to motivate and incentivize their customers to uh, to email or call their legislators. So when you do have a when you have a normal customer experience, fine, don't don't try to sell them. But if you have a customer who is told that it, you, they'd never get their data back and everything was gone, and you you know like take lint out of their charge port and it's like, oh, are these are baby pictures. Oh, just leave a tip in the tip jar. While they're ec ecstatic in that moment and excited and uh, uh, you know. Um, Head over heels happy. Tell them, oh, by the way, you know, this is how close your repair was to not being able to happen. Uh, if you had an issue with, let's say, this chip in your phone, I'm not able to get access to that. And the only way I get the schematics is from some guy who steals them in China. Uh, if you think that we should be able to keep doing what we're doing and you're happy, could you just, if you have some time, go to this site and tell them what you think of the right to repair bill. So when you have those really ecstatic customers, here's something you can give them to try to get them to actually take action. Let them know how close they were to their repair not happening. Because most people take for granted that we exist. They have no idea all the ridiculous crap that you and I have to go through in order to get parts or schematics or diagrams or access to anything to do our job. They actually, we did a focus group in Boston and a, and, and a poll uh, it's about three or four months ago at Beacon Research, 99% of these people think that I just have on my shelf a bunch of parts and diagrams that I just buy from Apple and I, I just pick from this. And like, what am I even complaining about? They have no idea the lengths that we go through for any of this. So I want the repair shops to start educating their customers when, you know, once they're at that point of being happy and they say, oh, thank you so much. You saved my life. Okay, by the way, here's how close you were to not getting a repair. I see. All right. I, I think that's fantastic. And I think you and I, hopefully when you when you come by, we're going to sit down and talk. I'm going to give you my address. So you could come actually visit the shop and we could sit down and just have a, a back and forth like this one. But um, you, you didn't see the the last part of this episode. It's coming out Sunday. But this is pretty much a, a, a big effort that we had to do for another, uh, I guess. I know, I know you don't like saying certain words, but what would you call a person that... Uh, makes and produces YouTube videos. You wouldn't say a YouTuber, would you say, don't don't say influencer, I hope. Content creator? Couldn't have said it better. So there's another uh, popular content creator that we had uh, that, that whose Tesla died, unfortunately. So you know how Tesla has uh, a thing where, you know, you have this warranty and it's gonna last forever and Tesla has a million mile battery, it's gonna last, it's gonna last so long, everything's gonna be perfect. Well, unfortunately, this person fell victim to the, uh, this car wasn't exactly under warranty and um, their warranty was up and they were hit with a repair bill for $22,500. I think in one of the was videos, it, sorry. Warranty is up as in like they, it's past the time or warranty is voided because you went over a pebble on the road or something. Uh, no, this one's even better. This one, the warranty was up because the, it passed the time. Because of the time? Because of the time, yes, the car was uh, over the uh, mileage limit uh, as well as over the year limit. Yes. What was the mileage limit? Uh, the mileage limit was, I think, it, the car had about a uh, hundred thousand miles on it. 
Okay. And what was the issue, or is that uh, would that be a spoiler? No, no, it, it's totally fine. That already occurred in the past. So uh, the issue with the battery pack was it was no longer uh, charging to full, which is about you know two hundred and twenty miles of range. It was only charging to forty miles of range. So what ended up happening was inside the uh, the pack itself, you know, there's uh, there's sixteen bricks, individual twenty four volt bricks inside the Tesla battery pack, and two of those were degraded to the point where the entire pack was only registering it had a forty miles of range. So brought the Tesla. Tesla said, "Oh yeah, sure, no problem. Um, we see that uh, you're having an issue with the battery pack. We're going to replace the entire battery pack for twenty two thousand five hundred dollars." You know knowing full well the car was only worth about $22,500. And uh, he decided, you know what, I think I want an opinion. And thankfully, you know, uh, shops like us, like we exist. And uh, he came to us and we, we fixed it for him on the component level. Removed the battery, opened up the box, took out the two bricks, put in two new ones, charged so it actually has the same voltage as the other cells, put it back in, and he was ready to go. So is this just an issue of a couple of the banks of cells were degraded too far, so the BMS just turned them off? Exactly. That's exactly right. And they won't happened. replace a bank. of How many banks of cells are there in that battery? Because I'm not sure. Uh, there's uh, 16. So there's 16. And how many did he have that were bad? Uh, he had two. How does two turning off give you 20% the range? Exactly. So two of them were, were had a faulty reporting. And uh, it actually brought down the entire pack to the point where it said, you know what, I'm not going to give the full capacity here. So the car wouldn't supercharge and it wouldn't fast charge in any other capacity. So they're it not going to change the two packs that are bad. They wanted to change the entire thing. The entire battery. Yeah. For 22, and this is kind of one of the things that Apple will do with screens. Like, for instance, you know, I understand that they want to replace. Oh, this is actually good that I have this right here. Uh, they oh, they want to replace the, the entire display assembly rather than just replace this 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 glass LCD cell inside itself because they right. see it as a cleaner repair and I understand that they see it as a cleaner repair but when a customer comes in uh, who has a five hundred dollar computer from two thousand and eleven uh, or that's probably worth two or three hundred now the choice to replace a fifty eight dollar LCD cell even if imperfect makes more sense than replacing a five hundred dollar assembly on a device that is you know. 10 years old, but not only do they not offer that option to the customer, which is fine, I respect them not offering that option to the customer, they go to LG and Samsung and say, don't sell the screen to any anybody else. We used to be able to buy the screens from those, from LG brokers and Samsung brokers and Chime and, and uh, AU Uptronics brokers, and now they just all say, no, we're not able to get access to any of this stuff anymore. So you don't even have the option to offer that cheaper option to your customers. And I think what a lot of people miss out on is they think, simply because I wouldn't go to Rich, I want the entire battery. I don't care if my car's worth $10,000. I want to pay $22,000 to fix it. They don't understand that it's about choice. It's about you being able to give that option to somebody else. And... Uh, even if they don't want that option today, they may want that option tomorrow when it comes to some other device that they have that breaks that they can't afford to replace or some other item where they don't care if it's 110% perfect. They're okay with it being 99% perfect. And the issue is with that option being taken away from people, but more so that most people don't even know that it's that bad. Does anything I learned from the Massachusetts focus group, which again, Massachusetts is one of the best education systems and highly educated populace in the country, is most of them really think, they just wonder why are people like you or I even complaining about anything at all? They, they think that you just go to the Tesla factory and you just, you, you know, you, you just like a la carte picked out the little things that you want and that you're just probably too lazy to do that. And that's why you make the videos you do. Right, exactly. I, I think uh, you touched on a good point that people don't realize that you, Apple going up the supply chain to prevent people from also having the access that they have to actually sell parts, that makes it 10 times worse. I mean, the, a company could say, you know what, we don't feel like fixing this. This is how we fix things. What we're going to do is instead of replacing things on a component level, we're going to replace the entire assembly because it's easier. You could hire people that, you know, work at Wendy's. Uh, for, well, no, that's not a bad thing, but people that don't really have a lot of electronic experience. You could say, you know what, we're going to pay you X amount, just replace the whole assembly. We're not paying you to think any, any critical thinking on this. Make sure you go ahead and replace the whole part, send the customer on their way. Well, people like us that could actually dig a little bit deeper into things and find do some root cause, cause analysis, it makes it a lot different and better for the consumer. But, you know, Apple's practices of going up the chain and saying, hey, you know what, guys, we don't want anyone else to have these parts either. It makes it 10 times worse. And a lot of that is what Tesla does, unfortunately. Uh, the way they carry things is they actually carry the tools 
to have access, not necessarily the parts, but they make it so that only they have the tools to diagnose individual issues with cells and you know replace the batteries yourself. Like you can't do anything yourself unless you have the test toolbox. And the interesting my very, very pessimistic outlook on the future is that this is not going to be something that just happens with Tesla. So if, for instance, with computers, the idea of your BIOS being locked on a laptop or a desktop that you buy so that you cannot install any operating system besides the one that they mandate, that would be unheard of. People would be out there protesting in the streets if every computer were like that, where you could only install this operating system. When, it come, when we switched and everybody was talking about how mobile computing is the new paradigm and this is how everything's going to work, once we switched over to cell phones and tablets, 99% of the tablets and smartphones out there, the bootloader is locked. You can't install your own operating system. You can't install the bloatware from the manufacturer until someone comes along and hacks it and figures it out. And we have come to accept this as normal. We accept it with normal, with portable computers, with, with handheld and mobile computers, even though we would never have taken that seriously with desktops or laptops, which is what, let's face it, most of this stuff is based on. Now with cars, there's nothing that makes an electric vehicle less inherently repairable than, uh, than an internal combustion engine vehicle. I'm not a mechanic at all, but I, from everything I've looked into, there's nothing that makes an electric vehicle less repairable. Everything that makes an electric vehicle less repairable has to do with choices the manufacturer made. It's not because technology is moving forward. It's just too complex for Rich or anybody else to fix. It's because they go out of their way to make sure that you can't get access to things that you need to get access to. And I think most consumers either think, A, well, you're making it up, or B, you're not making it up, but that's just the price of progress. And there's progress. There's you know, Having a phone that has a more powerful processor than a supercomputer from 30 years ago is amazing progress. But th that and the fact that the bootloader is locked on this phone so that I can't install my own operating system, these two have nothing to do with each other. And the fact that an electric vehicle is whether it's more efficient than an internal combustion vehicle, whether it is more um, reliable long term because you have less less parts that you have to deal with in the chain uh, that uh, or no oil changes and all that, that has nothing to do with the fact that they make it difficult for you to work on. So I think as this paradigm shifts from uh, internal combustion engine vehicles to electric, every manufacturer is going to try to have this new paradigm come with this new 2021 idea that you can't fix anything. So like with with ICE vehicles, you could say, you know, if they stop making a spark plug available, every or oil, everybody would yell bloody murder. But you can say in the Tesla, well, you're not able to get access to this battery pack or this part of the drivetrain, and you never had that before because you never had those parts in the car before. So I, I really do believe that you're going to wind up seeing Ford and Chevy and Nissan and all these other companies when they make electric vehicles. I think that they're going to follow in Tesla's footsteps and do the same thing. I hope I'm wrong, but I, I hope you're wrong too. But you bring up a good point. So when you brought up the bootloader on phones and, and various issues on a deeper level with components and electronics, why do you, why don't you think that more people aren't outraged? Do you think it's because that we look at things on a different repair scale than the average consumer? For example, let's just say I have a phone. You know, I'm a regular guy that has a phone. The phone doesn't work anymore. I'm really frustrated. I go to Apple. I say, okay, Apple, how much is this phone going to cost to fix the screen? They say, we can't fix the screen. You have to buy a new phone. I say, hey, you know what? I really need this thing and you buy a new phone regardless. Do you think that most people actually succumb to the company's policies, therefore they're not really sure or not really aware that there's other options? I think that as you, every time you have a new paradigm, you have a different set of expectations. People had a different set of expectations when this came out than what they would have for their computer. But then by the time most computing is being done on here, it's already too late to kind of roll back the expectation because you've already bought into the fact that you like having a smartphone. So now you can't really go back to not having a smartphone just to get something that doesn't have a locked bootloader or that doesn't come with Google crap on it everywhere. Uh, where and I think that it's gonna I, that I wouldn't be surprised if it winds up being the same thing with cars like you, you transition people over to electric vehicles and then once they're there oh yeah by the way you you, you can't get access to the motor you can't replace a, a rotor a stator a gear or, I don't I don't know shit about electric cars I know about electric bikes but I'm just naming parts off of a fang motor that you can all that you can buy so you know I have I love electric vehicles I like electric stuff I mean I could in my be my befang on my bike I can replace the rotor the stator the nylon gear uh, the mo the motor core all of that stuff is completely replaceable it's not the fact that it's electric that makes it hard I, I don't think consumers are aware that this stuff is that these op all independent options are available I don't think they're thinking about repairability until they need it to be repaired but above all every single time you move the paradigm forward a little bit you're always able to get rid of the expectations that were grandfathered in and the ability to 
to you know load whatever OS you want on your computer. That was grandfathered in. When it came to smartphones and phones in general, nobody was thinking about the operating system on their Nokia 3310. And then when they got one with a slightly bigger screen and a keyboard, they weren't thinking about it. Kind of slowly evolved into the smartphone. But people were never thinking about the bootloader on their phone. And by the time it becomes a computer, it's too late. And I think you know with, with cars, they're not thinking about the carburetor or the transmission or the spark plug or any of that because electric cars don't have it. By the time people figure out what breaks on electric cars, they've already, they already own it and it's too late for them to be at a point where they go, wait a second, you don't sell that? Which is why I think it's important to raise as much awareness about it now, especially since um, in Massachusetts, it was uh, Nissan, Ford, Honda, General Motors, and Toyota that all spent 25 million combined convincing, trying to convince voters that if uh, people like you are able to fix cars, that they're going to get raped in a parking lot, which, yeah, which was absolutely disgusting. By the way, I, I hate even thinking about the commercial they ran. But so, how do you? What do you think is a good way to raise awareness to people? Number one, that shops like us exist in the first place, because everyone automatically assumes when something breaks, like you have your phone or you have your car. If your car breaks you have to bring it to the manufacturer. You have only one choice but to go to Tesla. If your phone breaks, if your Apple breaks, or anything like that, your Android phone breaks, you only have one choice but to go back to either Samsung or Verizon where you got the phone from, or even Apple in some cases. How do we let people know that they have options for repair now? The, it's not about making your customers aware. It's about making people aware before they become your customer. If you post a repair video on YouTube, at the end of the day, the only people who are going to see that repair video are people that are already need a repair that are already screwed. I think getting people to know that this is an issue before they need a repair is a big part of it. So you need to be a storyteller. Like your videos, I don't see you as a repair person or a mechanic. You're a storyteller, especially that that video, uh, I forget if it was like the July 4th or the, the one, one with the Tinder date or something. That, that was fucking hysterical. Like I, I didn't, I didn't watch. I, I don't, I don't give a crap about fixing cars. I don't, I don't watch. I, I don't watch videos and fixing cars. I watch your stuff because it's hysterical. So people are watching you because you're hysterical and you're a very good and compelling storyteller who just so happens to have a Tesla garage repair business. So even if they don't need a car repair, even if they're not looking into buying a car, they now know that this is an issue in this industry. Even if they weren't interested in it. So you have a way of getting across to people who have no interest in cars, electric cars, or car repair that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And I try to kind of do something similar, which is get people involved in a story. I don't just want to do a video saying, the manufacturer doesn't allow you to fix things, and I'd like to fix things, and this is something you should care about. I don't, I don't just like carry a sign down the street that says, right to repair, right to repair. I try to create a compelling storyline. I try to create a, you know, like I talk about my business. I talk about all the other stuff I talk about. And I just so happen to be a person who fixes motherboards and sees this as an issue. So there's a lot of people that don't use Apple products, that don't need component level board repair right now, that wouldn't even know, have known to look for it. Who, who are watching, who are now aware of it. So there needs to be more compelling storytelling out there to get people to realize that this is an issue before they actually need a repair. Because once they're at the point of you needing a repair, they go to the manufacturer, they get told you're screwed, some wind up at your door or mine, but still the numbers show that a vast majority of people end up just saying screw it and throwing it out and buying a new one. If, if that wasn't the case, then they wouldn't continue to get away with it and they wouldn't continue doing what they do. So I think it, we, there, we need to find more people who are good creative storytellers to get people involved and excited about this, be, not, not because they're, they're really excited about right to repair, it just so happens to be stuff, something they stumble along while they're watching you do a video on a, on a Tinder date with the, the shitty flute music play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, I, I appreciate your kind words. Uh, I will say, speaking of storytelling, uh, one of the best examples, and I'm going to leave a link to that video uh, in the description box. I think one of the uh, the best stories uh, as of late that you were involved in was the Wall Street Journal article that they ran um, about the uh, the repairing of the, of the MacBooks. It was nice, short, sweet, easy to digest, and it was a real world example as to what someone could actually go through when their MacBook, MacBook Pro, or MacBook Air dies or has an issue, what your choices are for repair. You could either go to Apple and they could say, hey, listen, we can't really do much about this except charge you you know, eight or $900 to replace the screen, or better yet, you're better off buying a new computer versus what you do, you're able to actually save the customer money and influence people to say, hey, listen, there's other options out there uh, for repair besides going to the manufacturers. That was actually a great video for 
for a lot of, I guess you could say, newcomers to digest and say, wow, I can relate to this video because this is me. I actually have this issue. I have a laptop that needs repair and I physically can't afford to go to Apple to have it done. So I think that was a great, uh, again, a great video. Thank so you. I'll be, uh, I, I mean, to be fair, you didn't have much to do with it. You just kind of talked, uh, but Wall Street Jones did a great job. Yeah, the, the the really interesting part of that was it just shows how illogical the manufacturer repair was because the device that was one year old that had uh, damage everywhere, like it was completely unfixable. It looked like it had been through a sewer. Had, they gave her a price for that one that was, I think, four or $500 less than the one that, that was five years old that had very minor damage. So five-year-old device that's worth less, very minor damage, they said almost a thousand bucks. The one that looked like it had been through a sewer that I couldn't fix if you gave me two years, they gave her a lower price for that. So not only does their repair pricing make no sense, but like when they say, when they told Congress, they claim that they don't make money on repairs. I, I believe them, but that's not because they're nice. That's because they're dumb at it. Right. So, so here's my question for you. What do you think, uh, a lot of companies, they kind of, to, to parent this agenda of going green, of being super green. Do you think that companies are just kind of using that as a disguise for people to actually purchase their products? Do you think they're actually trying to go green? Do you think that Apple, you know, no longer including charges for phones is them in fact going green or they want you to actually put more money back in their pockets by buying more accessories for with whether the chargers, that it's, it's with the chargers. It is technically true that it is more green for them to not sell you more stuff but that's not the fucking reason they were doing it. It just so happens that that, that is conveniently true, but I don't believe that's why they're they, they doing it to save money. And when it comes to, like, I think a lot of companies, when they talk about how green they are and all the recycling initiatives and all that, at the end of the day, I just see it as them being a watermelon. You know, they're green on the outside, evil or red on the inside. Like they just want to make as much money as humanly possible. And they, they, they greenwash you. They talk to you about their recycling programs and all of the, like, tell me more about your recycling programs. And you're saying, I have to throw away everything in the screen assembly over here uh, because you won't allow me to buy the LCD cell. Again, it's okay if you don't want to replace the LCD cell that's on the inside side of this assembly. I can't buy this because you tell the manufacturer of it not to sell it to me. There's nothing that's green about that. I know that you're not recycling every single piece on this. And even if you are recycling it, you're never going to get as much out of it as you could if you reused it. And every single one of these companies that talks about how green they are is virtue signaling to avoid the to avoid any sort of regulation coming to them. I think they learned from the 90s because Bill Gates he, when you listen to those, uh, when you listen to those congressional hearings, and the he sounds evil. He looks like a villain. He sounds like a villain. He's being sarcastic, and he fit the you know the stereotype of your corporate villain. But um, I think what a lot of c corporate CEOs have learned nowadays is if I can just pretend to be as progressive and cuddly and nice as humanly possible, that we can avoid uh, being regulated, even if we're doing things that are far worse than Bill Gates bundling Internet Explorer w w with the computer. And I think that trying as much as you can to move things towards a disposable and irreparable society where the manufacturer owns the product and not you is I'm not I'm not defending Bill Gates for what he did in the 90s. I think it's 10 times worse than what Bill Gates was doing in the 90s. Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. If you're a company, if you're a, a multi-billion dollar company that has, you know, tens of thousands of employees worldwide, do you think that it's worth Apple's time and effort to do the type of repairs that you do? You do the type of repairs that most would just kind of run away from and just say, this is even impossible. I'm not going to waste my time doing this. Do you think it's smart for Apple to get the customer in and out at a higher price replacing the entire, let's just say it's the motherboard versus actually desoldering chips on the board and replacing them with different ones. Do you think it's actually worth their time to do that? I think it is. And I think that's why when they give customers replacement boards, they often give them replacement boards that have been refurbished by another service center. So somewhere at Apple, somebody is doing board level refurbishing because I've seen customers that have went to Apple for a board replacement and they come here, let's say, because something happens, uh, all of something else happens to the machine a few years later. And I can tell that this is a board that has had work done on it because they didn't remove the flux. And you can also tell from the barcodes on the board, some of the serial numbers and some of the barcodes tend to be ones that are being refurbished. So somewhere they're doing that, they're just charging the customer or the full price for a board replacement up front rather than a board repair. 
even if they think it's not a viable model to the customers, I'm not even mad at them for thinking it's not a viable model to, to, for themselves to do at the scale that they have. I'm aggravated at them and I criticize them for not allowing others to do it. If you don't want to do component level repair, fine. Don't do component level repair. It's too much of a pain in the ass. Don't tell Texas Instruments and Intersil don't sell chips to anybody even if they want to do component level repair. Don't tell LG and Samsung don't sell a screen even if one of us wants to replace a screen so that we can recycle this and actually reuse it the way you're supposed to and recycle reuse and renew like make stuff available to other people who actually do want to do the work that you don't want to do yourself now why aren't they making that available to others is it a money thing or is it for your, your safety is apple trying to protect you from yourself from uh you know puncturing a board and having a battery fire one of the things that I learned from the Era 53 debacle, which is where when you replace the home button on your phone, if you update, it, it would work perfectly fine until you updated the operating system. Once you update the operating system, the home button on the phone, well, not only would it not work, but the phone would just be a brick. It would just say Era 53, and it wouldn't tell you this was about to happen. When this first happened, uh, the, the PR at Apple said this is for security. So they went out to the press and said, this is about security and independent repair shops must be doing something wrong. And then a year later, it came out that that was actually in there from the, it had nothing to do with security. This was there from the factory. So that if you got a, if there was a phone that was manufactured and the home button was impaired properly with the device, that it would say error 53 and it would never make it to a retail store. So what this tells me is that what PR says and the actual reason for something are completely different. So when I go to a legislative hearing and I hear some lobbyist that sounds like they're, you know, it sounds like they're, they're reading some sort of graduation speech at high school off of a piece of paper that somebody else gave them. When they sound nervous and they have, they're stumbling and they don't know what they're saying and they said, this is safety and security, I don't believe that's the reason. I'm confident that they do have a reason somewhere. And I would love to speak with the person who's actually in charge of making that decision so that we can discuss what that reason is, um, have a conversation about it, and try to come to some compromise that works for both of us. But that never happens. They send out a lobbyist for a trade association that reads off a piece of paper, something that's not the actual reason. With Era 53, it had nothing to do with security. It, had, it was a quality control thing, so that wasn't supposed to be there when the phones were actually released. It was only, that thing was only supposed to be there in the factory, so that when they're producing the phones, they know this phone did not have the home button paired properly. But the PR person never called the engineers and said, hey, what's this about? They kind of tried to solve it without having to bother the higher ups. And the way I imagine they did that is they just pulled something out of their ass. So when they say this is about privacy, security, or safety, I don't believe that. I don't believe the PR people and I don't believe the lobbyists. There may be a genuine good reason for them not making all of these parts available. And I'd love to know what it actually is. I'd love to speak to someone higher up to figure out what that is, but I'm not, I haven't gotten to that level yet. Now, in terms of your communication with Apple, I know that uh, you have a lot of uh, sometimes colorful things to say about them. Have you ever been reached out by them uh, in, in any official stance to kind of say, hey, you know, let's work together or, hey, stop doing this or, hey, we're sending out Lori's act to you type of book. The one thing I ever got was a phone call from Kilpatrick and Townsend in 2016 where they expressed displeasure at the fact that I have a video up. It was uh, how unauthorized idiots fix Apple laptops and that I showed a snippet from a schematic in that video. Uh, I spoke with a lawyer about it and I had them represent me. I, I My face turned white when I got that because I know a friend that had his shop ransacked in North Carolina over you know buying stuff that had, uh, buying display assemblies. He was buying used display assemblies that had Apple logos on them. They were used, they were original. And he had a shop ransacked by, uh, I think it was Ice or Customs or something. So I, I like my face turned white and I, I was, I just thought like, this is the end for me. And um, my lawyer said, you should probably just take down this video. They're asking nicely. And I wound up, you know, telling him, I really appreciate your time, but no. And I told them, I will take down my videos if you file a DMCA claim. All you have to do if you want my video down, I'm not going to fight it. Just file a DMCA claim. Because if you do that, you have to write the reason for it. And I want you to write in that little box what they he should, what Lewis showed on screen at 58 seconds is the, is, is the crime which is where I said, and it's 58 seconds or 59 seconds in the video, that's where I said, here is the fuse between your trackpad and keyboard and the motherboard that, so that if, uh, or the power line, the motherboard, so that if you get a little bit of water over here, it doesn't blow up your whole computer and here's how you replace it. I wanted the general public to know that Apple wa is mad that I'm showing you how to replace a fuse in your product. And uh, they, they never got back to me on it and they never filed the claim. That was the only time I ever heard from them. I called their bluff. I, uh, you know, probably gained 30 gray hairs waiting for their response on that one. And, uh, and nothing else ever came of it. I would be happy to sit down with them, start from scratch, like seriously, take all the F Apple stuff I've ever said, put it aside, 
have an honest conversation. How can we make this work for both of us? How can we do this in a manner where you get good PR because you now you're actually doing something that cares about the environment, where you're making money off of the fact that we are doing what we're doing, whether it's a subscription service, the parts, schematics, or chips, or anything like that. But we and we're also able to provide good quality repair services because, as you can see, Apple, I'm still doing everything that I'm doing. The independent repair industry is going to exist with or without you. I would like it to exist in a better way. I want there to be more informed technicians. I want them to be using better parts, not dumpster diving through boxes of LCDs that somebody in Taipei got off a truck or something. How can we make this work for all of us? What are your concerns? And how can we work to address those concerns? I'd be happy to put all the other meme stuff aside for a moment, all the humor and the aggravation in the past, and just have an honest conversation and figure out how we can move forward. I'd be happy to do that. I just genuinely have no idea how you go about even doing that. I started having this discussion back when uh, I was, back when I had about 50 or 100 YouTube subscribers in 2013, I, I really never thought that I would, you know, be the voice of some national movement or that there'd be a million people watching. Like, it still freaks me out that there's more than 50 people even watching this. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'd, I'd be more than happy to talk to them and work all this stuff out and try to figure it, hash it out. But I, I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think you have a lot of uh, of fans in a lot of places, and even more so than you realize. When you think about it, uh, I, I've always wondered this. But when when I was looking at your um, your your Wall Street Journal repair video, it, what stuck out to me was the fact: how do you actually get the, a lot of the diagrams that you follow to repair the boards on the Macs? Is that a lot of them are just leaked internally from Apple themselves? Why do you think you think people are doing that purposefully? to actually help the greater good? Or do you think they're doing it for financial reasons? You need to get a kickback from someone that buys them off of them. What's the main reason you think there is for that? I once, my girlfriend wants to know why I'm not home. One sec, I'm gonna send her a picture of me streaming. She's, I think that the reason that they do this is because they get money. Like, I don't think that the person who's risking their job and, and risking their, you know, themselves going to prison or something is doing this because, you know, solely for that. I, I imagine that there's someone that's offering them money for it. Or it could be different. I mean, when you, if you think about the where is scene from like 10 or 15 years ago, when you think of like release groups like LOL, XOR, Saints, uh, CTU, all those release groups that used to release television shows and movies on uh, FTP servers that then went to Usenet, that then went to Kaza and Emule and all that. They weren't, they weren't getting paid a dime. They did that because they liked making things available. They didn't like that if you wanted to, that back then, if you, you, the only option, if you missed watching a television show, you waited for it to come out on DVD two years later. You didn't have an option back in 2004, five and six to be able to go to iTunes movie, uh, you know, store, Netflix or YouTube. You didn't have that option to be able to watch a rerun of a TV show that you missed. If you missed it, you missed it. And they, there were all these release groups that loved making stuff available. That's what they did. And there was, this, there was this, and I think it may be some of that same mentality, which is, you know, why is it, I have all the information here. Like, why, why can't I? I mean, like, it, there was probably people with television capture cards and HD home runs back in the day that thought to themselves, you know, I have everything I need here to be able to record this show and distribute it. Why is it that if you miss last week's episode of 24, that your only option should be that you have to wait for it to come out on DVD? Like, screw that. Uh, I think it's the same thing. There's probably somebody who has that schematic in front of them who thinks there's millions of people that want this product to work again. And the thing sitting between them and having a working product or their data is this PDF file. Screw that. I'm leaking it. Maybe they get a sense of personal satisfaction from doing it. Or maybe they're only doing it because somebody's offering them $50,000. I have no idea. I'm so far detached from that food chain. I, I just go to Venafix or, you know, notebook schematic or something and pay the five bucks every when it's available to, to buy it. Or, or sometimes every now and then someone will email it to me. But like, I don't know what the motivations are. I'd love to meet and speak to some of those individuals, but I completely understand that they likely want to remain entirely anonymous. Oh, no, for sure, for sure. Um, I don't know, man. I think, um, I think a lot of this we can continue to talk about next week. I don't want to give people too much information about, uh, uh, about our pending meeting coming up soon. But other than that, man, I appreciate you, uh, you talking to me about this stuff. It's very important. And um, anyone watching this, make sure you check out uh, Mr. Rossman's channel. Again, there's a link below. Uh, but check him out. He talks about some really uh, fascinating stuff, way more technical than I, than I would ever be. I'm just you know, more of a showman, and he's the actual doer. Ah. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool to see. Uh, you haven't seen me try to fix a car. 
<laughs> I would, I would um, say that's really true. But thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Of course, man. Anytime. Um, so, okay. Yeah, I, I could edit it. I'll edit it here and, and do the thing. But yeah, that, that was perfect, man. That was good. That was really good. Yeah. Um, I have to send you the, 